Welcome to Cities on a Plate, everyone. It's so good to see you all. We're in Lagos today, Nigeria's vibrant metropolis. Please type in what city you're joining us from in the chat. As you know, the Cities on a Plate series was born out of a lot of quarantine cooking in 2020, where I found myself suddenly mining childhood recipes and trying to recreate dishes from the places in the world that I've traveled to and lived in. Um, so today, since we're in Nigeria, it is wonderful to be able to break the cola nut together with you all, regardless of where in the world we are physically located. Today, Lagos on a Plate is all about celebrating the brilliance, the style, the flavor of Nigerian cuisine through some of the country's finest culinary creatives and entrepreneurs. So we're hearing from Ozoz Soko, a trailblazing food historian and culinary creative. Then we'll hear from the award-winning interior designer, Tola Akerele, the author of the Orishirishi cookbook. Unfortunately, Hilda pulled out at the last minute, but the show must go on. Uh, so as usual, we're keeping things nice and interactive. Um, remember, as we go along, you can type in your questions and comment um, to the chat. Uh, that Steph is facilitating today. And she might actually ask a couple of people to voice their questions if you'd like to. Hello, Baltimore, um, Athens, Georgia, hell in the UK. It's so good to see you, Nairobi. Our first panelist today, Ozoz Soko, is an exploration geologist by training who has spent over a decade mining the richness of Nigerian cuisine uh, through her award-winning blog, The Kitchen Butterfly. Her work now also includes the creation of Feast Afrique, an incredible documentation of West African cuisine's influence in the world that also hosts a digital library of over 240 archived culinary publications spanning from 1828 to the present. Ozoz's work has been featured on Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown, on Al Jazeera and CNN African Voices, among many other places. Tonight, she's taking us on a journey by plate around the world with Akara, the Nigerian bean fritter. Welcome, Ozoz. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you everyone for joining from across the world. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. I'm an, an, I'm an adopted child of Lagos. Um, I'm Nigerian. I didn't, I didn't grow up in Lagos, um, but there are many, I spent many holidays and, you know, lots of time in my childhood and teenagehood. And then later on in adulthood, I, I lived in Lagos and it's informed a lot of my food ethos, philosophies, ideas, and understanding of Nigerian cuisine. And so I'm thrilled to be here, you know, representing a great, diverse, vibrant, complicated city. Um, and, you know, it was really nice for you to start with Fela. I can I could feel the energy and the vibe. So, yeah, I, I'm really happy to be here. So today I'd like to share something around Akar and around its different forms. I, I talk about Akara, which is this bin fritter that exists across, you know, West Africa and has diasporic expressions in the Caribbean, anywhere where Black bodies went, were forcefully taken, reside, there is some form of Akar. And so I'd just like to talk through that. Um, the next slide, please. And, you know, when I think of Lagos, all of my memories are really entrenched in food, and whether that is street food, whether that is food of my childhood in fast food restaurants like Mr. Big's, who made the best jam donuts ever. Like, look, I've eaten donuts around the world, and none of them compare to my, to the early childhood memories I have of eating this jam-filled, red, sticky, sweet, chewy donuts that had 
like a dimpled surface on one side, the lightest crust of white granulated sugar. And, and Lagos is full of food. You know, when you go on the streets, you have everything from Akara in different forms. Akara fried in vegetable oil, Akara fried in palm oil. You have soft agege bread, which is a sweet yeasted bread. You have beans, you have stews, you have sauces, you have meats, like you have so much food. And when I think of the streets of Lagos, when I think of street food, I think about it as giving us a glimpse into the soul of the city, understanding what it is that fuels the city, what it is that sustains the bellies of people who are actively working to keep that city alive. And Akara is definitely up there. You'll find it on the streets every day, but especially on Saturdays. And if you go to the next slide, um, it talks about what Akara is. And, and when I want to embark on understanding the larger context of food, I start with dictionaries. I think that dictionaries play an important role in talking about etymology, in bringing together similarities. And this extract comes from the Oxford English Dictionary, an online version. And it, it describes Akara as West African and Caribbean. And it says it's a ball-shaped fritter or sauteed patty of seasoned mashed beans, especially black-eyed beans. The dictionary context is interesting because it omits a few things. I personally would always include that when Akara refers to a bean fritter, it's referring to beans, the use of raw beans as opposed to cooked beans. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes people make things that they call Akara with already cooked beans. And that may work. But the original version uses uncooked raw beans. And if we're thinking about similarities, it's kind of like a falafel where chickpeas are used. And here it basically goes through kind of like a historical documentation of where Akara has been mentioned. So an 1852 dictionary talks about Akara being a kind of cake. And they're different kinds. So it talks about akara fule, which is a soft cake. It talks about a version of akara with okra. And it just it talks about akara as a hard cake, which was food for warriors. And you know, there's a lot that it omits because also there's akara in the context of rituals and of funerals and of celebrations, particularly in Yoruba land. So, but it kind of goes through this chronology that's interesting and that for me situates Akara in a historical period because there's often a dismissal of West African cuisine on the basis of not having traceable roots. But I mean, 1852 is over 150 years ago, but we also know from records that Akara was established in Brazil um, through the cooking of enslaved people in the 16th and 17th centuries. So these foods have long histories. And while they're not always, you might not always be able to find reference and documentation for them in West African culinary annals, you'll find those in diasporic spaces and books and literature. But it essentially just goes and it talks about, you know, it makes different references. And what is interesting is that it stretches from the continent through to the Caribbean and other parts of the, of the Black and West African diaspora. Next slide, please. And I chose Akara because it's probably the singular most transformative food experience that I've had. I grew up eating at Cara. Uh, on Saturday mornings, especially, my mom would make us soak beans, wash them, blend and fry at Cara. Like, and, you know, I, for, for a while, I thought that was just something in my family. But in further research, it's actually almost a Nigerian thing. 
And Nigerian cuisine is regional, but there are certain elements that you would consider national. And eating at Kara on Saturday mornings is one of them. You find that across the country, you know, on the streets, people buy on the streets, people make at home. And it's a real labor of love. And, you know, my, my favorite way to eat it is with soft white agege bread. Bread that has great texture, but not enough flavor to detract from the deliciousness of Akara and the crunch. The next slide, please. And, you know, I say Akara is the dish that has been most transformative in my journey and food career. And I pair it with this sentence by James Baldwin in his book, Giovanni's Room. And he talks about how you don't really have a home till you leave it. And then when you have left it, you never go, you can, you can never go back. And this speaks to how we as human beings transform mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and how home takes on a new definition for us. Next slide, please. In 2009, I was living and working in the Netherlands and I had a colleague, Santiago, who was Brazilian. And one night at dinner, we were talking about foods from home. And I've told this story many times, but it, it still remains the singular most important part of my food journey. Because what it did was it took me from food as something for the body and something that nourished me to something that was almost spiritual and that nourished my soul and that gave me understanding of what enslaved people experienced. So my colleague is talking about this dish and he's like, oh, you know, there's this brin frita, a carajet. And I was like, what? Because before then I had never heard of Nigerian food, West African food present outside of Nigeria. And so it kind of woke me up. And, you know, later on when I would encounter that James Baldwin post, I realized that I didn't really appreciate Nigeria, Lagos, places I had been, Nigerian food culture, till I moved abroad. And, and then in comparison with other cultures, I was like, Nigerian food culture is so rich. Is it, is it, it is as rich as all these cultures I'm experiencing and tasting and kind of made me reframe my approach. And I think it, it gave me a newfound respect for the culture, for the food, for the people creating it, for the people coming together to share different aspects. And so that kind of propelled me into looking in more detail about these recipes, trying to understand the biography of Akara, who makes it, um, what are the definitions of it, what kinds exist, how do we, how does it fit in into the regional culture, the national culture, and it, that took me deeper into understanding where Akara had been and its relevance in other spaces. Next slide, please. And because of what my colleague had said, I started researching deeply about Brazilian Akara Je, And I was stunned because for me, it seemed like there were two worlds. There was the world of Nigerian Akara where we just ate it. There wasn't any significance. It was just, yeah, food. And when I looked at it in the Brazilian context, I was shocked because in Brazil, a carajé is considered food of the gods. It is a food that is highly revered. In fact, there's a group of women called Bayanas who are daughters of the goddess Iyasa or Oya. And Iyasa is a is her ritual food. And for the longest of times, these women were the only people who were allowed to make a carajé. It was handed down through oral tradition from mother to daughter in the temples. They were the custodians, the purveyors of this knowledge. And I was stunned because enslaved people weren't allowed to read, write, document, but they preserved this food culture by word of mouth by the power and strength of orality for what, two, 300 years? And if that isn't amazing, I don't know what else is. And it just gave me a new understanding also of being abroad, right? So I was abroad at this time, I was homesick and I was writing a food blog to kind of preserve Nigerian culture without a deep understanding of how that strengthened, sustained, energized me. 
And I found kinship and I found parallels with what the enslaved had done, how they had immortalized Akaraje. They had documented it. They had kept it alive. And even though my decision to move abroad was unlike theirs, my decision was one I took freely and one I chose. And in their case, they were forced, they were stolen from their homelands. It just spoke to me about the strength of food and the power that it brings and that it holds and how, you know, the idea of comfort food is just more than the belly. And a carriage is so important in Brazil that in 2004, the government categorized it and awarded it heritage status of intangible cultural heritage and not just the food itself, not just the way it's served, but everything associated with it, the tables, the women, the Bayanas set their food on, the Bayanas themselves, how they dress, which you'll see, it's beautiful. They wear white. And you're thinking, these women are frying things in palm oil all day. And yet they have the grace, they have the confidence, they have the composure to wear white. Me, the day I wear white and drink a cup of tea, you can imagine that I will create visible trails down you know, the front of my top. So there's... There's just so much that I was able to compare and contrast with the carriage, and that led me on to other things. It led me on to explore the differences between how akara is eaten in Nigeria. In the previous photo, we typically eat akara in bread, but in Brazil, they'll cut it open and have it like, it's almost like a burger bun. The akara is working as the bun. And when you Trace that back to the definition in the dictionary. You see it described as a kind of bread, as a kind of cake. And so putting all of that together creates this. It, it gave me many questions. You know, it led me to ask myself many questions about what a carrot is, what it might have been, and how the way perhaps it is in Brazil right now is what it was two, 300 years ago. And how that is kind of like a time capsule for us who have watched, who have experienced or who continue to experience Akara in ways that may not resemble that original format. And so looking at foods of the diaspora, for me, it's kind of going back in time. It's, it helps me craft a journey, a timeline, it helps me put things into context and I find that personally enriching. The next slide, please. And so just looking, this is a contrast between Brazilian Akarajé and on the left, you have the Baiana in her white headdress with like a covered, a, a collared waist wrap and, you know, colorful beads around her neck and sometimes her ankles and her, typically she might have colorful bracelets as well and how she has this headgear. And if you look at the photo on the right, which is one I took of a lady called Ruth um, in Lagos in 2018, there's so many similarities. And we see these connections that we might not otherwise see by juxtaposing things. They're kind of wearing similar dress, just different colors. And that's where you contrast the everyday kind of circular way it is in Lagos with the more ritualized version in Brazil. But for all intents and purposes, they could be sisters. They could be the same women doing the same toil, feeding people, nourishing bellies, nourishing souls, and just feeding them through this simple fritter. The next slide. And the one thing, and I, I share that in various respects, the one thing that Akara and Akaraje did for me was expand on this notion of food in a couple of, in two key things. So there's a quote, yeah, um, and it talks about sandwiche e alimenta, akaraje e comida. And it talks about these two concepts of alimenta as where food serves a functional process. It, you're hungry, you eat, you get energy for your body but also food as comida, which is food for the soul, comfort food, food that nourishes your mind, that brings you comfort in a way that you might not be able to articulate, that is beyond the physical. And 
those are the two things that guide me when I think of food. It's never just about the primary function. You know, for me, when, when I make things and when I want people to explore and experience food, I want them to, I want nostalgia to come into it. I want them to reclaim heritage. I want them to explore identity. I want it to be comedia that is this rich space of experiencing food beyond what's just on the plate. So when I want you to experience the city and I wish that I could, you know, have plates of Akara on your tables right now, hearing this history, hearing this cultural aspect, it would be great for me to, I would want you to experience all the multiple aspects of food that go beyond just the taste in the mouth. Um, next slide, please. And so I started, you know, Brazil was the first place I went on this journey of exploring connections with Lagos, with Nigeria. And I started thinking about what's in a name and how can names help us trace roots? How can names show us all the ways that we're similar in spite of our differences? And on the next slide, you will see a map that shows you where Akara has been across the world. And for me, whenever I explore food, I know that there are a lot of differences in how we communicate and how we're related, but I also like to look at the similarities, not that they necessarily bind us together, but that they show us that we are, there's a common core, there's a root, the elements that join us together. And when you look at the names of Akara, in most places, it's made with beans, but you'll also find versions, for instance, in Haiti, where it's made with saltfish and malanga. Malanga is kukuyam or taro. You'll find different variations of the names, so from Akara to Accra to Akras to Akara, you know, to Bolitos de Carita, to Callas, all of them related. And, you know, a linguist will explain how C's become K's and how L's substitute for R's and, you know, but when you just, you look at this map, you see that across West Africa, across the diaspora, from the islands, the Caribbean, Latin America, to the American South, there are these connections. And that things transform where we're using beans, rice, salt fish, which is like salted cod, um, banana, plantains. And some people have said, okay, did Accra come from Accra? Um, Accra was a very powerful city during the time of enslavement and slave trade, still is a powerful city like Lagos. But, you know, what are the origins? And those are some of the things that I desire to explore with my work. But just looking at things visually, looking at the geographic spread, help me establish these connections. Next slide, please. And one of the last. And, you know, there's so many aspects to exploring food, to looking at the origins, looking at connections. And it's important work that we all have a part to play, whether we're eating, whether we're sharing. And I love the way Chino Achebe says it, or said it. He says that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. We have to tell our stories. We have to take interest. I know some people say, oh, enough talk about Jollof rice and, and um, Akara, and you know, let's look at other aspects. But I feel like all the work that we do as eaters, as supporters, as researchers, as people who have interest in food, everything we do is important. And I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Ozoz. I'm curious, you're joining us today from Canada. Um, you know, what I'm, I'm curious what impact or influence um, now being based in North America has had on your practice? For me, you know, wherever I am, there's an opportunity to learn. The pivotal moment in my food career happened when I lived in the Netherlands. And sometimes being remote from a place actually gives you a lens that you might not have considered employing. And so for me, I continue to research, I continue to cook. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to present a physical map, very similar to the one that I shared with um, a group of people in Toronto on Emancipation Day. It was sponsored by the city of Toronto. And lots of people who came up to, I had the physical map and you know we had discussions. A lot of the people who came up were like, I'm from the Caribbean. I didn't realize that it, that, you know, the Accra that I ate, ate had links to the continent. And for me, it's how do we inform people about these connections? It's for me, it's about creating awareness, first of all. We'll get to the levels of deepening knowledge and of gaining mastery. But for right now, how do we show people all the way that all the ways that we're connected? How do we inspire people, graphic designers? creators, makers, researchers, artists? How do we inspire people to explore their identity through food in their own individual practices? So being in Canada for me is just, it's given me space to be remote and to deepen my knowledge. Awesome. Thank you, Azoz. And so now talking about Nigerian food going global, uh, Tola Akerele is the award-winning interior designer who's cooking up a storm on Nigeria's cultural landscape with the international release of the Orishirishi cookbook, a delectable journey across the treasures of Nigerian cuisine, region by region, state by state. Um, a former investment banker, Tola decided to shift gears and move from London to Lagos where she co-founded Bogobiri House, a boutique hotel and arts center established in 2003 that houses the Orishirishi kitchen. Welcome, Tola. Um, Hi. Yeah, I'm Great. curious, what is the connection between the cookbook and Bogobiri House? So as, as you love rightly said, hello everybody, nice to be here, nice to see you all. Um, thank you, Ozos, for that wonderful, um, sort of detailed explanation about Akara. I've learned a lot today. This is eating it jolly way, eating it jolly way, not realizing there's so much history to it. So thank you for sharing. Um, so essentially, um, the, the kitchen, the Rishishi kitchen is in the Bugubri house. And the Bugubri house was set up um, a few years ago when I first returned um, to Nigeria. And um, my business partner, Ben Chike, was based in Nigeria. And there was really a reaction to the fact that there was nothing that really showcased us um, in terms of like accommodation or design as Nigerians. And so um, it's a very Afrocentric space which celebrates um, you know, art and music and, and some Nigerian food. We didn't really go far enough on the food. So the Orishushi Kitchen was really um, overdue by the time we actually set it up in terms of, in terms of offering um, proper sort of Nigerian um food basically so that's that's how we got set up basically great and mm. what does orishirishi mean orishirishi means um variety um i think when when you go and you eat and you, i mean context of food it means variety in any context but in context of food there's definitely a distinct meaning if you're eating um eating nigerian food and you're ordering you so give me orishirishi which means give me an assortment of different different mm. things so Orishishi is like variety, a mix of everything. So um, it's something to definitely, and it's just, I like the word, but it's sort of like, um, it's got sort of movement in the, in the, in the, in the syllables, Orishishi. So it's a word that I, it's like Gogobini as well. I like this sort of word too, which um, compounds like what it, you know, Nigerian um, sort of accent. Um, and you've had such a, you know, colorful professional career. You've been an investment banker, you're an interior designer, um, you're a hotelier, and now you're a cookbook author. Um, mm -hmm. What influenced your move from Lagos to London? To be honest, I mean, I was in London. London Lagos, sorry, from London to Lagos. Yeah. I was in um, London having a very jolly time. I, you know, I was working there and great life, but I had this very, very strong pull. I'd been in the UK for 20 years. I'd been at uh, boarding school from a young age, so I was sure what I knew. I came home regularly though, but I had a very strong pull to come to Nigeria. I thought if I don't come back now, 
I will never probably come back. And I thought I'd come back, I'd probably not like it and end up going back to um, going back to the, the, the UK. Fantastic. Mm. And just so everyone can, um, I'm going to provide a few pictures of just to get a glimpse of the gorgeousness um, of the Orishi Rishi cookbook. Um, Tola, how did you select recipes for the cookbook? Um, the recipes really came from the kitchen. And um, those really came from food I ate when I was growing up. Um, with, and when I was just talking about Akara on Saturday, I could totally relate. Um, you know, beans and fish stew on Fridays, you know. Um, you know, my mom's um, Eiffel Um, You know, so there's some things that I grew up on, which on the book. And some things I, when I came back to Nigeria, when I started working across Nigeria, I worked a lot in the East with my um, design project. Um, I found amazing soup. I didn't, I didn't really know about. I mean, it sounds odd to say. Um, I think when you're from a certain region, you eat your food, you eat your, um, you know, your, um, you know, your okra, you eat your iridu, you eat, you, know, you eat all the things from your area. But there wasn't that much experimentation. You experiment with other cuisines. Um, for some reason, I hadn't had that much. So when I started working, and I was like, what? My goodness, this is an you know, amazing food from the southeast. Um, from the South South, you know, I was working for Tacos and I discovered native soup, which I just couldn't believe I hadn't had before. And it's beautiful, delicious. And I just, um, so I adopted a few things from those journeys. And I always sort of try and oh, which I love as well, um, you know, from the, you know, from the South South, uh, also um, Afang, and I love Eddie Taikon. So there's so many things I, I, I didn't know about and I tried and I was like, wow, we have to like include this. Um, and then just also the journey of discovering more about the dishes and then consequently including in the book. Right. And mm. so as I'm showing here, you actually have a food map in the book where yeah. you mm -hmm. have color coded um, all the uh, sort of origins of, of, mm. of some of the dishes in the mm. book. Um, in your opinion, what's the tastiest region just mm. gaining in your personal, in your personal yeah. opinion? <laughs> Um, well, my favorite dishes, um, I mean, I, I, also, I love the food from, well, I'm from the Southwest, I'm used to that, but I do love the food from the South South. I do love, as I said before, um, the food from the Akko Ibom rivers, um, the leaf soup, the Afangs and the Eddie Kaipongs. But the thing is, I do, there's so many more dishes. This is like just the starting point. There's so much more. Um, so these are things that I discovered. I thought, okay, these are good. These are well known. Um, everyone can make them. But well, there's certainly dishes that um, resonate and things I think people should really know about. And the idea was also to share the sort of cross, you know, group exchange of trying different dishes. We tend to stick to our own um, region quite a lot. So I just thought it was really important to kind of include these things that I discovered myself. Right. And what was the most challenging aspect of um, writing the cookbook? I'm showing well, here the this is written, this is seafood uh, okra. Sorry, Tola. This is seafood okra, right? One yeah. of the most popular. I love how you write. This is one of the most popular dishes from the Orishi Rishi kitchen. Mm. Very, very popular. What was the most challenging aspect of writing yeah. the cookbook? So, um, I haven't written a book before, but I, I wanted to write a cookbook for a long time, and it really, and I'm sort of quite busy. It was only the lockdown actually allowed me to sort of have the time to think and. Um, I have the recipes already documented, but it's just the level of detail required, I think, was obviously, um, you know, very important. And just, you know, we don't cook by measurement, generally speaking. Um, we do in the kitchen because obviously it's a commercial um, business, but we generally don't. So having to sort of really fine tune those, those weights and trying the recipes out and checking and trying and checking and ensuring that it was all sort of, you know, people could follow it easily was quite a challenge. Right. Um, and I think also, I mean, I, had, I really had a wonderful team, you know, um, Angola, oh, she got took the beautiful pictures. And I was quite harsh with him for, I mean, who is this woman? I was a bit demanding about, you know, how I wanted oh, to look. Um, but I had a really great team who kind of understood the vision. But it was just, I mean, it's, it was the fight of the time. I live in a busy household. So I was waking up very early in the morning um, to write and um, late in the evening. Um, I gave myself quite a tight dead, you know, time frame because I knew that you know, the lockdown would end you know, at some point. So I was really sort of maximizing on, on that time to do that. So um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was a great adventure. I loved it, you know, but it was much more than like, oh, let's just write a cookbook. 
Well, actually, it's actually quite a lot that goes into it. Um, right. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved, you know, um, putting together, seeing the images, you know, just seeing people use it. I mean, it's just it's been it's been wonderful. You put such a striking image as the cover image, and uh, you know, of the cookbook. In fact, when you go through this, um, I love how you mention that. It's it's like there's no pressure. I mean, I feel sort of well. I feel like uh, I actually made the akara from the cookbook, um, you know, in anticipation of Ozoz's talk. But I, I kind of feel like I've had my hand held very nicely. But at the same time, the images are so beautiful that even if I didn't cook some of them, I just enjoy the sort of lushness of, mm. of having them kind of being in their presence, as it were. Um, yeah. You know, what was the significance behind those editorial decisions that you were so particular about? Yeah, I think the book is for anyone interested in Nigerian culture. You know, you might have heard of Nigerian food, but you might not necessarily know of the ingredients that go in, how to make it. So I think the imagery of the ingredients and the finished dish were quite important for me. Um, and then just of you know, the front cover, we actually had um, we had a few options, and that one just just really stood out. You know, remember Angela saying to me in the beginning, "Do you want it? Do you want it dark and moody or light and airy?" And I was like, "I don't know. I just, you know, just like you know, both just look beautiful." And right. so that was kind of like a dark and moody cover. Um, but I, I think um, we had other options. I think it, I, I'm happy with it. When it came out, I was like, "Yeah, this is the right like decision." Um, it's just the arrangement of the food, and he has a great eye as well. I was, I was quite bossy in the shoots, but he's got a beauty. He's got a great eye. He's so talented. And I sort of had to, I was looking for someone who could understand what I was trying to do. And he got it, he got it. And I think we, you know, we worked well. So I was really sort of, you know, happy that he was, you know, he was on board. And just, I mean, look at the pictures. I mean, he, he really made the ingredients and the, and the dishes come alive. Yeah. This image that we're looking at here is the, um, is actually on the Akara page, an image of the Akara ingredients. So that in the middle of there is the, the blended beans with, um, mm. you know, the, onion and the chili. Mm. Um, in, in thinking about your uh, interior design practice, it, it actually struck me that in creating, um, with the cookbook, you've created this really, this gorgeous, sumptuous space to house these recipes in. Um, what is, you know, is there a connection between your approach to the cookbook and your uh, interior design practice? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, very visual. I mean, design is obviously about function, essentially, but obviously creating spaces that are excessively stunning. And so I think that part of you know, the way I work, I want to present something um, that you can, you know, if you, if you to use the cook, but you could also just have it as a coffee table book, you know, and just share it, share our culture, you know, and my design as well. I mean, I try and bring as much of um, local artistic expression as I can. So that definitely was definitely a very important um, part in the book, the visual aspect of it. Also, our food um, it hasn't always, you know, it's not always presented um, in the best light. So I wanted it to be sort of something you could really pick up and think, yes, I, I want to, I can make this. I want to, I want to cook it. And there's a process to help you do that, um, and ways to simplify how you cook it, and where to get the ingredients from um, in you know different countries if you're not based in Nigeria. So uh, I did a lot of research on uh, the stockists. Um, so I think that the whole the book is really about encouraging um, you know, people to just to try, just to try, 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 try your food, try, you know, try Nigerian food. Um, right, right. Yeah. That's wonderful that you have a, a list of stockists um, yeah. at the back. You have UK, um, Canada, uh, the United States, you have Ireland yeah. in there as well. Um, incidentally, through trying to make something from the recipe I discovered in Nairobi, in my neighborhood alone, three different um, Nigerian shops. It just really made me wonder how many are, are in Nairobi itself, you know, um, but also just thankful to live in a time and live in a sort of global city mm. um, where, you know, I can go out and, and get my stockfish, um, yeah. get my palm oil, uh, yeah. which is incredible. Yeah, I, th um, I think the Nigerian um, store, food store, I think it's probably every country in the world, I'm convinced of that. Because um, Nigerians, we are actually everywhere. Um, we might not know how to find them, but there's certainly um, a Nigerian um, food store somewhere in your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
uh, as well as just uh, bringing you into the conversation about the Orishirishi uh, cookbook. Well, first of all, actually, I, 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 I was wondering, as someone who suffers from a sweet tooth, um, one of the first things I notice is that there's, there's you know, no dessert section. Um, mm. Why is that? Yeah, well, the things, I mean, fortunately, I mean, I love food. I eat a lot, but I mean, I'm not mad on dessert. Um, thankfully, it would be a big problem. Um, but I, I'm not really big on dessert either. I maybe also some food more into it. I mean, maybe she's discovered some dessert, but it tends to be um, a lot of small chops, like, you know, pop off and um, fruit salad. And, you know, so we're not really huge on dessert. Um, in, in this in this region, that that's the main reason. But I, I love to hear. I mean, you always said you come across, you know, any sort of more, you know, um, interesting dessert because I, generally yeah. speaking, we're not yeah. you know, pastries, yes, um, but not so much dessert. Yeah, we're looking at an image of the um, of zobo, the zobo, hibiscus yeah. um, drink, and in conversation, Ozoz, I remember us talking about, um, well, actually, I think it was a TEDx talk I was watching of yours, um, talking about, you know, Zobo jam, why not have Zobo jam? And um, it, it was lovely um, to, to hear that. So just bringing uh, you into the conversation about Orishi Rishi, um, how have cookbooks evolved, um, Nigerian cookbooks evolved, um, you know, from those 1800s to the present? And where would you categorize Orishi Rishi um, in the canon of cookbooks that you've archived? Orishi Rishi is a gorgeous book. I mean, the first time I came across it, I was in Canada already and I found like, I, I did everything to get it, get it to a friend of mine who was going back to the US. He bought it for me and then he mailed it to me. It's just a gorgeous book. And I think the difference, it's not even, it, it's a progression of where we were, where documenting food in the 1800s was really around capturing the recipe. Um, at that time, I think the, the primary function of books was preservation. Today, it's a lot around showcasing history and culture, showcasing the richness and diversity and being able to do that beyond words. And so the images that accompany the Orisha Rishi cookbook are really powerful in how they stand up for the cuisine and the culture, in how they celebrate it, in how they're also, that you can be beautiful without being pretentious, right? And, and that's what, there's, there's a certain level of really, you know, you can relate to the images, but they're absolutely gorgeous. And they put Nigerian cuisine, for me, in pride of place, because these cultures and these cuisines have always been looked down on in the context of European colonial, white supremacist mm -hmm. documentation. They've always been considered ethnic, in, um, inauthentic, um, unrefined which is a load of nonsense because many of the dishes can go head to head with any French recipe, yeah? And so for me, just seeing this, the respect and thoughtfulness with which the recipes are put together, the images are collected and taken, that appreciation of culture, yeah, it's it's amazing. And I think they're all on a spectrum. In in cultures and cuisines that are nascent, that are young in the preservation space, everything is important. Uh, audio work is important. Video work is important. Communal exchanges. Everything counts to help us build that catalog of resources that people with different needs can access. Well done. That's awesome, Osos. And I just wanted to call on Kate Kate. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but um, had a great question for Tola. I don't know if you want to ask it or I can ask. Uh, the question, Tola, was have you felt pressure to bring Nigerian food to the world and how do you deal with staying authentic 
to the cultural origins of the food. Thank you. So I think the, the cookbook, the, the dishes are very, the very, the very traditional um, recipes. I think there's a lot going on in the space now where you have amazing young chefs doing great fusions. You're just you're using um, Nigerian ingredients to make you know, different things. Amazing young guys. So the book is not, doesn't pretend to be anything else but traditional Nigerian food. And it's, and it's cooked in the traditional Nigerian way. There are ways to make it easier, but I didn't really feel any pressure to bring it to the world. It's just how the food is, the ways to make it easier, but that is how Nigerian food is. It's not a fusion, it's not modernized, it's not um, trying to be something it's not. It is actually just authentic food. So it was quite easy to just sort of, just to put it as it is and then sort of help as much as possible to allow you to cook it and enjoy the process of cooking it through the glossary, but to get the ingredients and also the cooking process is sort of, you know, there's a chapter on making it sort of easier to cook. Um, so it's, it's very much how it is. I didn't try to package it in a way that the world could understand. Um, um, even though there's so many dishes in there that translate so easily. I mean, jollof rice should be like, it should be known globally. I don't know why it's not um, known. It's rice cooked in a spicy, delicious tomato sauce. Why isn't that? Um, a global dish by now. So it's sort of to help, you know, aid all these things because I'm, I'm proud of my culture and everything I do through Bogadri and my design. So I just really wanted to share that um, with the world um, in just in a, in a very sort of simplistic way. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Um, yes. Can I say something? I think the idea of authenticity is great. But my version of jollof rice will differ from the person yeah. down the street. And, and so the, the, there isn't a like one template, their general approaches, but also individual preferences change. And I feel like all of that comes together. And sometimes we get really rooted and anchored in what is authentic. But if we delve deeper, we'll find, for instance, that what we consider authentic we are using ingredients that went originally from that part of the country. So authenticity has a great, it's a great beginning, but we can get trapped because mm -hmm. our claims of authenticity may not be able to be substantiated if we drilled much deeper. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a really, really good point because um, you know, when people use the book, like, I didn't cook it this way, I cook it this way, but this way is like really, you know, it's much simpler. So um, it's just like the food is, I mean, some of the dishes actually have become national dishes. Egosi came from the Southeast, but it's now a national dish as it were. So the way it's cooked across the country will vary, um, but I've cooked in the way that I know how to cook it in a way. So um, people that's going to the book might, oh, I thought it was different, but essentially, it's, it's the dish, um, the, the ingredients are, are the same, but the way you cook it might be slightly different. Um, so yeah, so thanks for that. Again. And uh, Tola, is there a digital uh, version in the works? I know it's on, it's available on Amazon, UK, uh, UK amazon.com. Um, yeah. yeah. is, is there a digital version in the works? Oh, yes, they've asked me. I mean, I really wanted, I, I like, I love books and I love having something in my hand to hold. And um, so I kind of, I think it probably eventually will come digital, but right now it is a physical book. And that was on purpose um, because I just think there's something lovely about having books. Books are just dying out far too quickly. And so um, I've kept it as a book um, because of just, you know, my passion for um, cookbooks and books in general. Yeah. The, the sort of labor of love that's gone into creating this almost just reminds me of the intensity of the process of creating like an egusi soup, um, you know, that there's just lots of parts and, you know, this, you know, this smoked and just all these elements carefully considered um, just coming together as a, as a labor of love. Um, as well as I'm curious, uh, you know, you, you talk about storytelling um, as a way to sort of get us thinking, our minds thinking where we aren't currently in the present. Um, what are some of your favorite novels, Nigerian novels, if, 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 if possible, um, about food? So, so my, I like the Things Fall Apart series. 
um, by Chinua Achebe. Then there's a book I read recently by a young lady, Francesca. It's called Butter Honey Pig Bread. It's a novel. She is is a novel set in Lagos and following the lives of twins. It is a delicious book. It's a, I mean, every chapter has a recipe worked into it. The story is centered around ingredients, flavors, memories of childhood food. It is, that's one of my favorite books. And I think good writers always include food and food culture. And what that does is it actually really anchors these stories in reality because we all eat, right, to varying degrees. And so, yeah, I, I love the intersection of literature and food. So sometimes I go, I, I do a series called Eat the Books where I recreate dishes from popular novels and from literary works. Um, the production asks a question in the chat and it's, has the Black Lives Matter movement attracted new audiences or grown interest in your work? Yes, it has. But sometimes in very weird ways, so people wanting you to do lots of stuff sometimes for free, you know, and 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 it's interesting because you're torn because a lot of times you want to showcase and you want to share. And so I'm really particular about the communities and the spaces where I share my work because I've also seen a lot of performative and tokenistic offers. And, you know, I, I love people who understand the role of food in society, who are interested in community building, but who are also interested in exploring design, um, how things are built, how things are put together. And that's why I love the work that you do, Lucy. And, you know, it's just, you, 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 you tell stories of thriving, complex, complicated beginnings and spaces and so again, thank you for having me. Oh, welcome. Thank you, Ozoz. Thank you, Ozoz, for that. Oh, someone, Li um, Liara has asked if you could repeat the title of the second book. Perhaps you could write it in the chat, Ozoz, the second book that you mentioned. I'll do that. Um, and Tola, has, have you, um, has the Black Lives Matter sort of impacted the Orisha Rishi cookbook in any way? Just speaking to um, that. I think it, it, there definitely will be an interest. I mean, it hasn't directly impacted. People say to me, oh, it's such a good time to write this book. It's a brilliant time to write the book, you know. Um, but obviously the book was written, you know, before the Black Lives Matter you know, movement. Um, but if it means people will take interest in our cuisine and we want to find out more, um, then it's obviously it's good for us. Um, but no um, direct, you know, um, you know, interest at all. I guess the book is something I did just out of um, just a passion to document these great recipes and just get them out there um, right. for those who, like me, who didn't grow up in Nigeria and who are um, in the diaspora and want to kind of bond back with your, you know, with your, you know, cuisine of your home and remind you of things you, you ate and know how to cook them. So um, I hope it does. I hope it does. You know, means people take more interest in our food. But nothing uh, direct, you know, there is you know, nothing directly. Um, yeah. And how is the, um, just sort of thinking what's um, what's in the works for, you know, either sort of for Gobiri as a larger entity, the Orishi Rishi Empire, <laughs> well, you know, what's what's next? Well, there is something happening, but um, I won't say too much. But we might move across the continent and do more discoveries in terms of documenting other but you know my interests are sort of culture, food, and uh, and travel. So it might be something in that space too. Oh, fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic, yeah. And and for you, Azoz, um, what is uh, currently next for you? So I'm working on continuing to research these dishes that tell us a lot about who we are, where we've come from, where we're going, how we're connected. So there's a Kara there. Um, there's Zobo, um, there are all these foods and drinks Frigion. that come from yes, which is known in Brazil as 
the joie de coco later, something similar. But it's just exploring these connections, seeing how they exist, trying to retrace the steps of how they've journeyed. For me, that's important. History is important in understanding the present, but also in shaping the future. Because if you know who you are and where you've come from, there's an ease with which you go through the world. I'm not interested in um, only the elevation of Nigerian cuisine, much as I respect that. I think it is more fundamental for us to in fact, the more people who have a basic understanding of the origins of the cuisine, who can speak to it and be ambassadors, the better for the cuisine and the economic um, consequences that has, you know, whether people are pursuing paths of culinary or gastro diplomacy. Um, so for me, I'm going to be doing a lot more work on archives and building archives on preservation, on having people explore the archives of um, and Fista Freak through different lenses. That's that's an expert plan. So I want to engage people who have various crafts and various practices that could they could explore the archives and document that. So not necessarily cooks, not necessarily researchers. That's my plan. Fantastic. People are asking, will you do a similar exploration for other cuisines within Africa? I think Feast Africa almost touches on that, right? Yeah, because it's West Africa. I, I have to be honest, as much as I, I love the idea of Pan-Africanism, my knowledge and interests are confined to Nigeria and West Africa. But I do encourage people who want to explore other regions um, to reach out to me if you want, I can I can share templates, ideas, approaches, and then you can build that for your region. I would be it'd be very much misplaced for me to want to take on East Africa, for instance. I don't have the range, I don't have the historical knowledge, I don't have it in my DNA, and so it's not something that I would want to embark on, or not particularly in able to embark on those sorts of journeys. So West Africa and Nigeria it is for me at the moment and probably forever. Fantastic. Um, a huge, huge thank you to you both, Tola Ozoz, um, for the ve very generous gift of your time and, and expertise today. Um, thank you also to my team behind the scenes, Simeon, Steph, Nana, thank you so much. Um, the biggest thanks of the night uh, to you all for tu tuning in um, from all, all sorts of different corners in the world. Thank you so much. Um, I'll send out an email with all the delicious links of things we've discussed today. Um, so do look out for that. If you want your city to be featured in future episodes of Cities on a Plate, please do reach out to me. Um, but keep safe and take care of yourselves. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely. Have Thank a lovely you. Bye. Thank you so much, Lucien. It was nice to see everyone. Thank you for joining.